Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Q&A session of About Abroad. For those of you that have not heard one of these before, I'm Chase. I'm the host of the show. And today, my guest is you, all of you out there in the audience. I have been fielding questions from you all for the last few weeks, months. And uh, every now and then, we like to hop into the mailbag and answer some of those questions, at least get to the ones that represent a lot of the consistent questions and topics and things like that coming from all of you. So if you'd like me to cover one of your questions in the future, you can send me an email, chase at aboutabroad.com. You can connect with me on social media at DC Warrington on most platforms. Uh, on LinkedIn as well, you can find me. And there's also a contact form. We'll link to it in the show notes uh, on the aboutabroad.com website where you can reach out and drop your questions as well. So I'd love to hear from you. This is probably one of the most fun parts of doing the podcast. I love the guests. I love uh, going deep on some of the subjects that we love to cover here and uh, getting to meet really interesting people from around the world, but also interacting with the audience is super fun. And so I always welcome those, uh, those questions. So please send them in. Um, I love to hear from you all and uh, really appreciate the interaction. Let's dive in to the first question. I've got a handful here, some really, really good ones um, that I think are uh, very representative of the type of things that, that people want to hear about. So and, and then the questions that I'm getting from you all. So I think this will be a lot of fun. Um, first question going a little bit personal here. Uh, I was following your road trip across Europe uh, over the past year and was curious to hear your thoughts on the experience. How long were you traveling? Which countries did you visit? Any surprises along the way or places you hope to return to? I'm considering a similar route next year, so would love to hear your thoughts. Fred from Holland. Thank you, Fred. Um, so he is referring to the past, uh, what, like, I guess, seven, eight months um, that I, my wife and dog and I have been traveling across Europe. We left Germany back in May and have been traveling since then, moving around with our camper van and common misconception. I don't live in the camper van. Um, we just use it as a way to travel around and we do some uh, maybe extended vacations in it every now and then, weekend trips, things like that. But for the most part, we're uh, we're renting midterm rentals through Airbnb or some other platform to spend a few months uh, at a time in a few different places. But we've traveled from Germany. We went down through northern Italy, crossed over into Croatia, drove down the coast of Croatia, Montenegro, Albania, and Greece, and ultimately took a ferry down to Crete. Um, and then spent three months on Crete, the, uh, the biggest island in the Greek islands. And uh, it was fantastic. Um, so I'll try to I'll share a little bit about the experience, Fred, and, and for anyone else interested. Um, but uh, essentially, I would say, you know, the, the highlight of the trip for me was probably the time that we spent in, in Crete. Um, since then I've left Crete and we, we ferried back up into Italy and I'm currently up in the, uh, in the Dolomites in, in Italy and going to spend some time in this area. I was missing the mountains. So we're, we're spending the winter up here. But for me, the highlight of the trip was, was Hanya, uh, Crete, unbelievably beautiful place, a smallish city of about a hundred thousand people. Uh, but it's the second biggest city on Crete behind the, the capital of Heroclean. And uh, it sits on the north side of the island. It's got incredible beaches all around it. Um, you can get around Crete very easily. I think Crete kind of has like a bad reputation for being hard to navigate or 
um, you know, roads being bad and, and whatnot. But um, I think that's maybe a little bit overblown. I think people talk about the bureaucracy and things moving slow and whatnot. I don't know. I've I've lived in a lot of different countries where, where things felt <laughs> as rough around the edges, I guess, or, or, or worse. Um, so that didn't really bother me uh, much at all. And the, and I thought the people were super friendly. That That's my highlight from like the, the time in Crete is that the people in Crete in particular are some of the nicest friendliest, most welcoming and hospitable people that I've ever met in my life. Um, so that was an incredible experience. Awesome food. Um, something I didn't know that I loved about Crete is the, uh, or about Greece in particular is the, uh, is the coffee. Um, Greece has an incredible coffee culture and, uh, they're really big on iced coffee, which is amazing in August during a heat wave in, uh, <laughs> in, in the Southern European, uh, Island country. So I really enjoyed that and just had a fantastic time. The low lights, um, we broke down in Croatia. We, uh, unexpectedly our engine blew in, uh, in Croatia. We kind of got stranded, had to improvise, rent a Airbnb for a couple weeks, um, and, uh, and stay in split, which ended up being a little bit of a silver lining cause we weren't planning on spending a ton of time in split, but got to spend a few weeks there. And that was a real, it's a really cool city. It's a bit touristy. Um, I get why, you know, it's, it's a little bit of glitz and glam for, for some people. Um, it might not be their cup of tea, but, um, I really enjoyed it. I thought split was, is a little bit underrated in terms of how much variety there is there. Um, so we were staying in the center of, split. And from there, I could be like in 10 minutes walking around this like beautiful Roman forum kind of thing and and lots of like tourist sites and and walking along the marina. And then like 10 minutes in the other direction, I could be running on some trails up in these hills overlooking the the sea. And then uh, five minutes later, I could be in a swimming in a beautiful beach um, with with crystal clear water. And uh, not to mention, it's like really well connected by airport to the rest of Europe and, and elsewhere. I had to take a trip while we were there to a conference. So it was very easy to get from there all the way up to Ireland. And so anyway, those those like it, it kind of uh, <laughs> it wasn't really um, ideal to break down. But on the and, and that was a pretty stressful uh, bit of time when we were trying to figure that out. It was also super expensive. Um, and so definitely kind of like changed the vibe of the trip. But uh, at the same time, you know, always looking for the, the bright side, we got to spend some extended time in a, in a city that I wouldn't have elsewhere. Um, big surprise for me was that uh, I, I didn't expect how challenging it would be to travel in Montenegro and Albania comparatively to other uh, to, to the countries in the EU. Um, it was pretty clear as soon as you passed into Montenegro and, and Albania uh, how different it was, um, just like in terms of the roads and, um, traffic and, and things like that. And like, uh, you know, all of a sudden our, our cell phones didn't work. Um, so there were like some just quick modern, uh, conveniences that suddenly went away. And, and we, we were kind of caught off guard by that. I, I, we knew what we were going to be exiting the Schengen and, um, and, you know, moving through those two countries, I just didn't expect it to feel so drastically different. It's not like necessarily a good or a bad thing. I was just, I was kind of caught off guard by that. Um, the hardest part though, there was like the, like suddenly, um, like road signs kind of disappeared. Uh, we traveled, it, travel became super slow. Um, especially like in Southern Montenegro in Northern Albania. So like, you know, congestion on the roads, small roads, like highways were two lane roads, uh, no, no road signs. Um, <laughs> at one point my wife is out like on an exit ramp, uh, like stopping cars so we can like get onto the exit ramp because the, the way the road was set up, you, you had to make basically like a, a U-turn to get on there and, um, like no vehicle, bigger than a moped could, could do that without having to do a three point turn. So like that kind of thing, <laughs> um, just became like a little bit, a bit normal for us. So anyway, yeah, that's a bit about the trip. It, it was fantastic. A, another cool thing is that I learned a lot about ferrying, um, around Europe, which is really cool. Like I haven't ridden a ton of ferries. Um, and like we were able to travel, uh, when we came back up into Italy, we basically avoided the whole drive and just did like a 24 hour ferry from, from Greece all the way back up to Northern Italy. And, uh, we were able to do this thing called camping on board where you can essentially like put your camper van or RV or whatever, 
on the ferry and then like stay in your camper van. You're not trapped in it. You can walk around the boat like anybody else. You can access the restaurants and the um, and all the convenience, the showers, conveniences, Wi-Fi, all of that. But you also just get to kind of like stay in your your home, so to speak. And that was really convenient. It was also like way cheaper than getting a cabin um, on a ferry. And uh, and, you know, you didn't have to like pack, unpack. You could keep your dog with you. So anyway, found that to be a really cool experience and, and learned a lot about the, the ferry system throughout throughout Europe. So, um, yeah, that's a bit about the trip. And uh, and now, I'm, like I said, I'm enjoying the, the mountains and the Dolomites and it's been a really fun year. So thank you, Fred. Great, great question. Appreciate it. Um, I got one here from Reese, who is uh, from somewhere in Southeast Asia. Very, uh, very precise. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur that is planning a move abroad. And one question I can never find the answer to is about entity formation and taxes. For example, should I set up an S Corp or for an LLC or should I create an entity in my home country, the US or my new country? Which is the easiest and best version for tax purposes? Would you consider doing an episode on this? I have considered doing an episode on this, Reese, but it's very specific and taxes and stuff are very, very hard to cover because everybody's coming from a, a different situation. And so it's just so complex, it's, it's really hard to do. I'm going to combine this one with another question that I got and then kind of answer them together because I don't want to uh, bore people to death with taxes and entities, but I do have a quick response for both of these people that, that come together. So the other question is, I'm planning a move abroad, but I'm so confused about taxes. As an American citizen, I hear everyone saying I'll still have to pay taxes in the US. So does that mean I'll get double taxed? And I hear about the foreign earned income tax exclusion, but I don't get it. What about Social Security here? Do I pay here? Do I pay there? I'm so confused. Please help. Smitty from Oakland, hoping to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, thanks, Smitty. Uh, thanks, Reese. So those two questions I'm going to kind of combine together. And for those of you not from the US, um, I'm going to also try to like uh, make sure that this is universally useful information, but uh, admittedly, it's it's going to be a bit more useful for the Americans in the audience. Um, so there's a couple things to like wrap up here, and I'm and I am also not going to spend a ton of time on this one because um, I get it. Like, if you really want tax information, we need to get you to a professional, which I can recommend you to. Um, we've had some some great uh, sponsors on the show that are in that space. I can I can point you to. So reach out, I'll connect you. But Here's the thing. So first of all, let's tackle the the foreign earned income tax exclusion and double taxes and all of this. So the the U.S. is famously one of the few countries in the world that will tax you no matter where you live um, in the in the world. And what that really says is that they will always ask for your taxes. You always have to file your taxes. That's not true of most people around the world. If you move to another country from, I'm just going to throw out, you know, Germany to Argentina. Um, like Germany and you register in, in Argentina, as far as I know, Germany's not asking that German citizen to keep filing their taxes back in the U S. Um, but America does that. So the natural thing to think is that, Oh, I'll always, I'll get double taxed. You won't get double taxed because most countries with the U S have double taxation agreements, um, saying that they, uh, basically if you pay your taxes in one place you won't pay, you won't pay your taxes somewhere else. You won't get, you won't have to pay the same type of taxes, um, in two different places. They'll offset each other. However, like if you got like a really low income tax in one country and then the U S saw that they may ask you for your income tax. Um, the, the difference, like the, the, the amount above that, what you paid in, um, in the other country back in the U S. So, that, that is a possibility. Again, like this is all for <laughs> uh, entertainment purposes. So do your own research, figure out, um, you know, what what you need to do. But this is this is the way it's generally done. Um, and then as far as like Social Security, it's kind of the same thing. Like Social Security is is different country to country. But generally speaking, if you're paying Social Security in one country, you won't have to pay it in another country. You'll just have to prove that you're paying it somewhere else. And that can be a pain. So that's that's one thing. The foreign earned income tax exclusion basically is like if you're making um, up to a certain amount, I think the number is around like a hundred and uh, five to ten thousand, something like that a year. So up to one hundred and five or ten thousand. Um, if you're making that amount and you're not in the U.S., three hundred. If you're out of the U.S. for more than three hundred and thirty days per in a in a year. 
So essentially you could be in the US for 35 days in a year. Then you are, the government basically is like, okay, you're, you're not here. So you're not using our resources that taxes go to. So we're not going to charge you for that. So up to that amount of income, you don't have to pay taxes. Um, income taxes, that is, you'll still be, you'll still have to pay your social security taxes. So that's what that foreign earned income tax thing is. And as a couple, it, you know, you can, uh, you can combine those and the number goes up and, and whatever. Um, so the idea it, there is, is that you don't have to, um, you, you shouldn't, you should be able to avoid the, the double taxation thing. Like you shouldn't think like, oh, my, ta- my tax rate's going to double when I leave the U S because I'll still have to pay my full taxes here and full taxes somewhere else. That's, generally speaking, not going to be the case. And there's a lot of ways to actually maximize your, your taxation capability. So again, talk to an expert about this. Um, and I'll, I'll recommend some of those, uh, here in just a second. The other piece to this that can be really powerful, and this gets back to Reese's question, um, is how you form entities and things like that. So the, the U S is, is actually sort of like a tax haven, um, in some ways, uh, and, and people are going to think that sounds weird, but it's a really great place to set up an entity and run income through that entity and then pay yourself taxes. So I, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but like we have, for example, LLCs and S corps and C corps and things like that. I reached out to my friends, uh, David and Crystal at clear tax and asked them because this is exactly what they do. And I'm just going to read a a snippet of the very long conversation that we had. Um, because I think this kind of will, will shed some light on, on what the entity formation can, can look like. So, uh, Crystal said, if, if an, if it's an expat moving outside the U S then setting up an S corp and paying payroll to maximize the foreign earned income tax exclusion can be valuable but only if a company is profitable. LLCs are often a better choice in early stages because they can pass through losses at the individual level to offset their income until profitable. Then once it is warranted tax-wise, it is fairly easy to convert to an S-corp for tax purposes. So this is really the best of both worlds and the simplest solution to start with, LLC that is. And then when you get up into higher income tax, higher income taxpayers, forming a C-corp is the way to go. Um, David went on to say that, uh, but if I was, if you're not a U.S. person, then I wouldn't recommend setting up an entity in, in a different country, um, because they, then you'll own a foreign corporation and that is a, a lot of paperwork and hassle. So if you're going to set up an entity in the U S he likes Wyoming as the best place to do that. And you can, because there's low, there's low cost, there's no state taxes, et cetera. But if you are not a U.S. person, then a U.S. entity could still be a good option because the U.S. doesn't care if you pay taxes anywhere in the world other than the U.S. taxes. And we don't share information with other countries. So if you are not a U.S. person, the U.S. is actually a tax haven. Very, very interesting stuff there. I know a lot of maybe a bit of jargon and <laughs> not the most uh, compelling info for some of you. But for those of you considering it, what I would take from this is two things. One is you can actually uh, really be becoming an expat or a digital nomad, you can actually like really maximize your, your financial capabilities by lowering your tax burden. Um, so moving abroad is often something people think, Oh, I'm going to get double taxed and I'm not going to end like, this is going to be a very costly endeavor. In fact, you could actually set it up to where you're paying much, uh, much less in taxes and you're traveling the world, living abroad, doing whatever it is you want to do. So, my recommendation is to talk to an expert about this. I'm going to put a link to the clear tax team um, that I just referenced in the show notes of this one. If you are a U.S. citizen, uh, I also recommend Greenback Tax. They're a former sponsor here uh, for just all of your like individual tax needs. But if you're looking at like entity formation and business setup and stuff like that and really uh, maximizing your um, your your tax uh, advantages of being an expat or nomad, then, uh, you know, clear tax might be able to help you out. So again, link in the show notes, they're not sponsoring this episode or anything. Just, uh, just wanted to answer those questions. So, all right, let's move on to the next subject. All right. So I'm from Canada and I'm considering a one to five year move abroad with my partner, our two children and our dog. We have our sights set on Europe, but we are not sure where we want to go yet. Your recent comments in a previous episode made me think of Greece, though, so I wondered if you could elaborate on your experience there and share the good, the bad, and the ugly, and anything else you want, uh, you think we should know before considering this. Dominique from Quebec. Ah, love Quebec. 
Um, all right. So I already touched on this a little bit, uh, with, with my experience. I think I went a little deeper on (laughs) my experience in Greece with the first question than I, than I planned to. So I've answered a bit of this already, but I want to hone in on the part about, um, you know, traveling to Greece in particular with your two children and your dog, because I think there, there's something that we recognized, uh, that was really important for us. So, um, I mentioned above how much I loved the the people in Greece. I love, obviously, if you don't love Greek food and Greek island beaches and architecture and stuff like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, but uh, but for I think for most people in the world, I mean, you 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 can't get enough of those uh, the crystal clear water and the and the amazing food and the the atmosphere and the hospitality and and history and all of that. I mean, it's just you know it's it's stunning and incredible, and you could spend. I could spend years just on Crete, just just exploring Crete. I've been to some of the other Greek islands and uh, they can they can be pretty touristy in a lot of places. If you go to Santorini or Mykonos or or something like that, um, it can be pretty touristy. So I would maybe avoid uh, those if you're thinking about like living there. Um, But but something I really wanted to hone in on. So we found Crete to be the hardest place that we've lived with a dog. There's and there's a lot of reasons for this, but and and I'm going to kind of paint a broad stroke here. But this is what a lot of locals told me um, is that there is still not a very strong mentality that like the dog is part of the family or something like that. So it's more like there's a lot of guard dogs um, that were like behind uh, you know, bars essentially. Um, and they're, and, you know, barking very intensely every time you walk by. Um, and there are a lot of stray dogs and stray cats and, um, no parks, no dog parks, no, uh, no, no, you know, space for, for that kind of thing. Um, we found finding green space really tough. Like we had to get far outside the city, drive 25, 30, 40 minutes to get to places where we could just like let the dog run free, you know? So, we found that pretty challenging to be honest, like the, as, as a couple that, you know, cares about our dog's well being, we just, we found that to be pretty challenging and, and not to mention, you know, we were there in summer, super hot, we, there happened to be a heat wave going on. So anyway, I, I think I say that just to say like, do your research. Um, if, if that's important to you, you Dominique mentioned their dog here in particular. And so I just wanted to hone in on that, but you also mentioned your children. And that is something that I got really interesting feedback on from some other expats and people that I met there, that they're really happy with the school system in Greece. Um, and so I had heard mixed reviews on that before and just found that to be really interesting. So again, like, you know, do your own research, but um, I had a lot of people telling me that they really enjoyed the the approach to the school system there in Greece. And uh, and and so I, f- I thought that was pretty, pretty fascinating. In general, I would say don't just focus on the islands. The, the mainland of Greece is incredible. I think I hope I'm pronouncing it right. But Thessaloniki um, is one of maybe the second biggest city in Greece, I believe, second or third. Um, but it's up on the mainland. And, you know, if you're looking for something different than Athens, you don't want the the hustle and bustle of Athens, but you still want some kind of a city. Take a look at Thessaloniki. Um, I didn't actually spend any time there, but it's like everybody's talking about it. And it reminds me a lot of Valencia in a lot of ways. Um, Valencia, Spain, before I arrived to Valencia six years ago. Um, people are really high on Thessaloniki. It seems to have a great mix of city, but, um, but not overwhelming, um, a lot of culture. It's a university town. So there's some youth there, just a lot going on, well connected to other parts of, of, uh, of Europe and, and, uh, even over into the middle East and Asia. Um, so anyway, I think, I think it could be, you know, worth considering, like there are some really incredible places up on the mainland, um, that are just like, you know, you'd think you were in the Alps or you would think you were in the, uh, you know, some, some like beautiful mountains and villages and stuff. Like it doesn't look like your prototypical Greek Island picture. Um, so consider the mainland as well. It's not all about the islands. Um, and, uh, but yeah, go and enjoy. Greece is amazing. And, and I, I can't recommend it enough. I, I think we will spend a lot more time in Greece. Um, for me personally, I think it's going to be more of like a vacationing kind of thing as opposed to living, um, for years. But, uh, but that's really just like a matter of preference. And, um, and I think there's a lot of people there living really, really happily. If you're considering this, um, we did an episode while I was in Greece a few months ago, 
uh, on the Greek digital nomad visa that our sponsor Lexity can help you get. Um, so plug for them, go back and find that episode. Uh, the, the Greek digital nomad visa is possibly one of the best in the world, in my opinion. Um, and I, and I think you should, you know, if you're considering Greece or you're considering a, a way into Europe, I highly recommend Greece as, as a, a way to go about that for the visa. And also because Greece is an amazing place. All right, let's see. Moving on to the next question. Thank you again, Dominique. That was, that was a really good one. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by my friends over at Lexity. I've lived abroad in various countries, and one common denominator I've found is that dealing with foreign bureaucracy is a nightmare. Trying to navigate visa and immigration waters in another language is not something I'd recommend ever trying on your own, even for the most experienced of us. So when I recently had to renew my Spanish visa again, I turned it over to the pros at Lexity. They've already helped more than 5,000 expats and digital nomads find a home and thrive in countries like Portugal, or in my case, Spain, also Italy, France, and Greece. Some very desirable locations indeed. So whether you're trying to obtain your first visa abroad, purchase a property, or work through international tax issues, Lexity's team of friendly lawyers is here to simplify your journey. The team is super knowledgeable, bilingual, and thorough, and I seriously cannot recommend their services enough. My experience working with them has been incredible, and I can honestly say I don't know that I would have have EU permanent residency if it wasn't for the help of the team at Lexity. So if you're ready to make your move abroad, then Lexity is offering an exclusive discount to About Abroad listeners. Grab 10% off your first service with the code About Abroad 2023 and learn more over at Lexity.com in the show notes and start your abroad journey today. If you've made it this far into the episode and you're still enjoying yourself, then I would love to ask a quick favor. Open up the app that you're using to listen to this podcast and leave a quick review. You can do this in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and really just about any platform that allows podcast listening now. If you can't find that in the interface of the app, then scroll down in the show notes and find ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, and you should be able to leave it from there. Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. All right. So my husband and I have been incorporating long workations into our lives since the pandemic gifted us remote work and some form of location independence. And this has been incredible for us. But oh, no, not the but. But now my boss is forcing a return to office and my husband's boss is saying we can no longer work internationally. Are you seeing this happen a lot? And or do you have any advice for us and our CEOs? What can we do and what should they know? Sofia de Argentina. Um, thank you, Sofia. Gracias. All right. Yeah, this sucks, right? <laughs> uh, this is um, somewhat normal, uh, unfortunately. I mean, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's the norm, but it's not it's not a rarity either. Like uh, there's there's a lot of leaders out there demanding these RTO return to office mandates that are um, not going over well with the, uh, with, with their, um, constituents there in the office now. So anyway, it's going to be, uh, fascinating to see how this plays out. There's some research out there that shows, and maybe this is something you can share Sophia with your, with your CEO, um, that workplace flexibility is valued at about the same as a seven to 10% raise. So like put that in perspective. If you walked, if me as CEO walked up to you, Sophia, and I said, Sophia, look, you can, uh, you're due for a raise. It's 10% raise. Um, so, you know, pretty significant. Um, but I'll either give you that or I'll give you flexibility to work from wherever you want. And about 50% of the time, someone would choose the flexibility over the 10% raise. So as a leader, I think this is very powerful information. I'm not recommending leaders hang this over people's heads and say, ha ha, you have to choose. Um, I'm saying they should uh, provide both actually, and they should provide the workplace flexibility because that's what people want. And you can actually get most work done, not all jobs, not all careers, not all people are, are, you know, the right fit for flexible remote work. Some, some things do have to be done in, in a physical space. Some people, it's, they're not conducive to it, whatever. Um, but for those like Sophia here and her husband who, who want to do this, uh, sort of thing, and it's, it's been good for their, uh, mental health. It's been good for their family life. It's been probably been good for their productivity and output, to be honest. Um, I would, I would recommend to those leaders that they need to start focusing on the, 
the outcomes and the outputs that Sophia and her team are creating and to stop thinking about work as a place because it doesn't have to be. It clearly seems that they've been able to be successful um, without having to sit in a cubicle or within four walls. Um, but yeah, the fact is, is that there's a lot of leaders out there that, that, you know, have hefty leases in place, rental agreements, um, office space that they can't offload and they are, they really feel the need to use it. There was also a lot of people who have failed to innovate at all. And they just think that we should copy and paste what we were doing in the office, put it in the virtual world. Oh, weird. This doesn't work. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess this remote thing, remote work thing doesn't work. Let's bring everybody back to the office. That'll solve the problem. That's kind of the, the loop that these leaders are caught in. They're, they're failing to innovate. They're failing to, um, look at the, uh, the tools and the processes and the things like that, that could actually move their virtual first team forward. So what can you do, Sophia? So there's a ton of research out there, tons of research showing how, uh, distributed remote first work can work, how workations actually positively impact your, uh, your, your output when, when done correctly. And, and the fact is, is that these leaders need to see that information They're They've either put their blinders on and they don't want to see it, or they're unaware that this information exists and they're, they've not really put the effort in to create a, a system that could work for everyone. So I would start by creating your case. I would show that you can continue to do this. I would go out there and grab these information. And, and we're, we're not talking about just, you know, blog posts written by happy digital nomads. We're talking about uh, thorough, in-depth research done by some of the top consulting firms in the world, like McKinsey, or some of the top uh, academics in the world from people at Stanford and Harvard and Oxford and, and all around the world. Um, so there's a lot to do. I, uh, I recommend um, connecting on, let's connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I will connect you with a few people that I would recommend following off the top of my head. Some of those people are, um, Nick Bloom, who's a Stanford professor who focuses on, uh, remote work research and, uh, and can really share a lot with your CEO or, and your team. Um, Phil Kirshner is a guy at, uh, McKinsey who puts out a lot of really important information that you could show that, you know, I think would really impress, uh, uh, someone like that. And, uh, and yeah, and then also, you know, just connect with me and I'll, I'll push you to some other consultants and people like that, that could, that could probably provide you a lot of information. The, the big thing here is, is that you, people have to, uh, recognize that these, um, these leaders are, they've been leading a certain way for a really long time. And it's the only way they know how to lead <laughs> and it's hard to change. And so we have to make change for them easier. So provide them with the information, provide them with the proof, um, and, and show why this can, you know, be a net positive for the team and for you individually. And if that doesn't work, there's never a better time to search for workplace flexibility. There's a lot of companies out there that have embraced it. And I would recommend, uh, taking a look at, at them because your options, you do have options. All right. Moving on to the next question. My family is moving abroad next year and we've done some scouting trips to Spain, Port Spain and Portugal, specifically to Lisbon and Barcelona. And we're now definitely set on the Iberian Peninsula, but we're torn between the two countries. We want a big enough city with a good mix of expats and locals, warm weather, good, good cost of living, good access to the rest of Europe. And my questions for you are, how would you compare Spain to Portugal and specifically Barcelona to Lisbon? And then are there any other places in either country we should be considering as well? Mike in the U.S. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah. So for for, you know, Mike, if you if you don't know or for anyone listening, if you don't know, I moved to Spain um, six years ago and I've uh, been living my, my I was trying to decide between. Barcelona and Valencia when I when I came and I just kind of like last minute chose Valencia, but I kind of planned to spend time in both uh, and figure out which one I wanted to live in. I had never been to Valencia and I had been to Barcelona just on some quick trips. So I didn't really know either very, very well. And I didn't know Valencia at all, but I was it was recommended to me that I might like it. And, and so I chose it and ended up staying there for, for five years. So, uh, I actually fell in love with Valencia. I think it's one of the best cities in the world to live in, uh, as a, as an expat. And, um, and so I highly recommend Valencia. It's not on your list here, but one of your questions is what, where would I recommend? I would definitely recommend Valencia as a, as a place to check out. 
but comparing the two, like, so I think, uh, I don't think you can go wrong here. Like Portugal and Spain are, are two amazing countries to live in. You've got incredible weather, fairly low cost of living comparatively to, to other places in, in Europe in, uh, though there's changes coming with the tax situation in Portugal with the, um, the NHR, uh, it's still favorable tax wise. Um, so if you're going to kind of like compare contrast here, I would say like, Portugal is going to be a little bit less expensive um, and they're going to have a little bit more favorable tax situation. They, I think they also have a little bit more favorable visa situation than Spain, making it a little bit easier for expats. So, you know, those factors uh, are, are kind of leaning in the direction of uh, Portugal. You also in Portugal have, I would say, like really there's a there's an emphasis on bringing expats and nomads to the country they really want you there and you know when i talk to portuguese people there is like a it, this is like a part of the conversation in portugal you know it's like a a concerted effort to get more of you there now there is also some pushback on this particularly in lisbon uh lisbon's had a lot of um kind of i, I think a little bit overhyped anger frustration uh towards towards the expats and and uh and nomads because they're saying you know rental prices are going up and things like this i b actually believe if you really dig into the research there it has a lot more to do with tourism than it does with the relatively small percentage of people that are actually living and moving there or spending you know six months a year um it's it's been much more about tourism that's that's inflated the prices there and the government should have done a better job protecting the locals um but anyway setting that aside generally speaking i think you have like a really strong desire they, they really want you there uh contrast that against spain like i just don't think it's a big part of the conversation spain's a much bigger country um the economy's stronger uh the bigger cities um and there's just there's there, there's a little bit of talk about digital nomads but it's not like you know they're they're not uh constantly having this conversation it's not a con it's not a concerted effort to to bring you there and therefore it's just not you know, top of mind. Um, it's a little bit harder to speak English in Spain than in Portugal. And when you're in Portugal, every, a lot of people, a very large percentage of people are going to speak some level of English, a lot of them really, really well. Um, in Spain, I find that to be less the case. Of course, when you're in Madrid or Barcelona or even Valencia, like it's not hard to get by with just English, but that's something to consider. And on the language note, I think you have to consider like, which language do you want to learn? Um, you know, for me, I really wanted to learn Spanish and nothing against Portuguese, but I just didn't have the desire to learn Portuguese. So when I was considering one or the other, that was a big factor for me. Um, so yeah, consider that. Uh, but you can't go wrong. These are two amazing countries, great food, great people, vibrancy, um, a lot to do. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, for, for me, what I really loved about Spain, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast is the diversity. Um, you know, when you're in Spain, you can get up to the Pyrenees mountains from, so you can be, you know, swimming in the, um, in the Mediterranean and then, you know, skiing up in the, in the, uh, Pyrenees in a few hours. And I think that's really cool. I also think there's just like a lot of diversity in terms of history and culture and languages and, and things like that. So for me, I, I prefer Spain. Um, but I would happily live in, in and around Lisbon. Um, I would also, I think Porto is one of, you know, I don't want to say underrated because it's not off the map by any means, but um, comparatively to a Lisbon or a Barcelona, Porto up in northern uh, Portugal is incredible. Such a cool city. Um, so my, my friends living there in Porto probably don't want me to talk about that because <laughs> they, they might not necessarily want more people moving there, um, but it, because it's definitely on the map now, but highly recommended. Um, and then another place that I'll mention, um, this isn't necessarily my favorite place in the world, but I know a lot of people that really love it, and that's Malaga in the in the south of uh in the south of spain so this is a mid-sized city of like a half a million people down on the coast in andalusia um, which is a very cool region of uh of spain and um and if so if you're looking for something like you want something definitely cheaper than the places you mentioned definitely less touristy um though malaga still gets a lot of tourists coming from particularly like the uk and britain um, they, a lot of times go further down the coast towards like Marbella. So Malaga still has like a, a very authentic feel to it in a lot of ways. And you still get a little bit of city, you get a little bit of uh, well connected to the rest of Europe with an, a decent airport there. Um, and, uh, and you can, you can have like a, an authentic experience, um, 
But again, my vote's going to go for Valencia. Uh, I love it there. And I, I think you can get the best of all worlds um, in, a, in a place like that. So anyway, you can't go wrong, Mike. You're going to have a great time. Uh, I, I wish you the best. Next question from Yin, currently in Japan. I started traveling and working remotely a year ago, and honestly, I'm not sure if I like it. I feel more lonely than ever. There's no real community. I've got no connection with my teammates at work, and I miss home more than I expected. I'm also working more than ever, odd hours, and a lot of extra effort proving to my team that I'm not slacking off. This was my dream, but it kind of sucks, and now I feel guilty about that. I'm not really even sure what my question is, but I wanted to share it and hear your thoughts and or any advice. All right, Yin, um, I feel for you, my friend, uh, because uh, first of all, I know you're not alone. I've experienced some of this myself for sure, and I know a lot of people have as well. Um, my friend Mitko and I did an episode kind of on this a few, a month or two, two, I would say ago. And, uh, and we, we covered this because I'm having a lot of these conversations in the background. It's one of the reasons we chose this question because there were probably five or six others, um, kind of sharing a very similar sentiment. So first of all, I guess, I, I don't know, misery loves company, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, maybe enjoy the fact that you're not alone and you, and you shouldn't feel guilty because, um, you know, this is, this is somewhat normal. I think, uh, I, I guess in general, we have a tendency to think, uh, that, you know, a change of scenery, um, and, and, ch you know, chasing our dream will solve all our problems, but there's a form of suffering in, in everything. And, uh, even when you get that shiny new object that you thought you always wanted, like you're always going to be a little bit disappointed. There's always going to be that sugar high at first that you, you feel really excited about. And, you know, it's the perf it's the best thing. This is what I always dreamed of. And then the nostalgia wears off and the novelty kind of dwindles and, and reality sets in and you're just living life again. And then you're wondering, well, why did I give up all of that to have this? This is sort of just the same as what I had before, maybe even worse. Um, so there's a lot to unwrap there. Uh, but I, but I think one of the things is to, to recognize that like you know, moving to a new place or, or chasing that dream is always going to have uh, a bit of a letdown uh, at some point. There's going to be challenges that you didn't uh, foresee. For example, in Yin's case, you know, oh, now I'm working all these odd hours and I'm having to prove to my team that I'm not slacking off. Like, that's no good. Um, I'd love to talk to your manager about how they're <laughs> leading because uh, you shouldn't have to be doing that. Um, and, and then, you know, like he's, he's feeling more lonely than ever. He doesn't really have a community. Um, he's disconnected from his teammates. You know, you miss home. Uh, they, like these are real, real things. So I think acknowledging them, um, and being aware of them beforehand, like this is probably, this is the likely thing to happen. If I was redoing my whole experiences abroad and like starting from scratch, if I was talking to myself, you know, 10 years ago, I would tell that person like, this is going to be fun. You're going to love it, but it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> um, this isn't going to be a, 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 va a life of vacation. And even if it were a life of vacation, that vacation would still have some bumps in the road. Um, there's downsides to everything. So yeah, I mean, I also miss home a lot. I miss friends. I hate missing, you know, I just missed a wedding recently that I really wanted to go to, but I just could not make it work with, um, with the travel and work commitments and, and everything. I, these are, these are really real things. I've, I sometimes miss being in that situation where you can just meet up with teammates and do stuff in person and just knock it out really quick or, uh, or go out for drinks after work on a Friday or something like that. Um, so these, these things are, are very real and, uh, and, and I get it. I think the thing I would suggest is this was a big changing point for me is that the, the nomad life can be very lonely. And I'm not saying that's the case for, for everyone, but it's yin here is moving around a lot. Um, and you know, constantly changing places. There's a, there's a reason you don't really feel like you have community. It's because you don't have roots. And, um, when you don't have roots, it's really tough to have community. You can, I'm not saying you, you can't, I know people who move perpetually and build a new community every month and they love it. And that's the life that they built for themselves. And that's awesome. Um, but that's not for most people, I would say. So consider settling down somewhere, consider going back home. And using home as a home base and, and having your community, but then using the freedom that you have to take a workation every couple months or every year, consider going back home more often. If that, if maybe you don't want to move back home, but consider, you know, putting down some roots and staying in one place for say three months or six months. And then in the middle of that, taking a couple weeks and going back home, um, that's not feasible for everyone, but 
uh, you know, that's, that's, that's also an option, like slowing your pace of travel in general, I think can be a key to success here. Most people that I talk to that are feeling some form of what Yin's feeling, they feel like they have to keep moving to, to get, to maximize this experience. And that's not what this is about. That's the key thing to remember is like, you're not, you're, nobody's judging you on, you don't, you don't have to check off every country in the world, or you don't have to, um, you know, hold yourself accountable to some ridiculous travel schedule. You've got to do what's best for you. And it sounds like right now you really need community and connection. And so Yin talking to you specifically, like put some roots down, settle down somewhere, pick a place that you really enjoy, stay for some time. Um, and insert yourself into the community. I think you need at least three months, like bare minimum in one place, just to find any kind of like a real community and, and really get to know a place like to, to where you kind of know it. Um, and you're not having to think through everything and search and figure stuff out. You're using a lot of brain power on just like logistics and you're not spending that brain power on making connections with real humans. <laughs> so consider that. Um, and, and, you know, don't, don't, uh, hold yourself to some ridiculous standard. Like you got to do what's best for you. And if you're not enjoying it, turn around and go back the other way. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I had someone say to me that they felt like if they returned from, they'd work so hard to get this digital nomad life and travel all the time. And they felt like if they returned home, they'd be returning home with their tail between their legs like someone's judging them. <laughs> and I would just say there is no spotlight on you. There's a thing called the spotlight effect where we tend to think the spotlight's on us. Everybody's focused on us. Everybody's thinking about us. Nobody's thinking about you. Nobody cares what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and so you just do what's best for you. If you return home, nobody's going to tell you, oh, you, uh, you failed, you know, no, you went and you had some great experiences. You realized you missed home and you love home and that's great. Good for you. Um, you learned something and you got some great experiences along the way and you can iterate from there. So it's not a failure. It's a, it's a, it's a constant process. And, um, and there's no guilt here. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have any guilt. You made some sacrifices, some changes and worst case scenario, you turn around and you end up right back where you started. Uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. So I wish you a lot of luck Ian, and, and everybody who wrote in on this subject. I think it's, um, it's an important one because, this whole remote work, travel all the time, nomad, living abroad thing, it can be very glamorized. You, you, you see very few people sharing the, the low lights, but it is, it can be frustrating sometimes. It's, it's bureaucratic. You, you end up dealing with stuff that you wouldn't ever have to deal with, or you feel stupid a lot of days because you don't know how to figure something very basic out. Um, you spend a lot of brain power figuring out logistics and like there's, there's clear downsides and, and, you know, not to mention missing people back home and, and missing events and activities and stuff. So these are all very real. And, and I, I wish that we would all share more about it. I'll, I, I try to here on the podcast, share some of my experiences and, and the downsides that I'm, um, encountering. And I, I think it's, it's more natural than, than the, the opposite, which is, you know, everything's perfect every single day. And, uh, and so that should be known. Um, all right. Last question, uh, from Tati in Turkey. Uh, you mentioned a few times in recent episodes that you hosted a retreat in Italy for your team. Can you elaborate on this and anything you learned from this experience? I've been asked to do something similar for my team, but I have no experience. And despite listening to this show, am not much of a traveler either. So I'm really just not even sure where to start. Uh, <laughs> thanks Tati. Yeah. So I actually, I, we picked this one because I hear, uh, this question a lot as well, and it's representative of what so many people are going through right now. So here's a little bit of context. Everybody, all these teams went remote of some, some sort, you know, you went from always being in an office to being somewhat distributed on some level. And then this concept of doing offsites, retreats, whatever you want to call them, uh, became super popular because, okay, we're not all in the office. So we need to go to a place to like, have this really cool experience. And, and this is a great thing. I think, I think like even the most remote teams should bring their teams together, um, a few times per year. I think there's, there's a lot of power there. Um, in my full-time role at Duist, uh, we believe in that we have a hundred people in 35 countries twice a year. We come together for a week. So every six months we're in, we're hanging out with our teammates in the same physical space. We also think this is like really important to invest heavily in. Like we, 
we want them to be awesome experiences. Like top, like we say, we want to do things at a world-class level. We want to do retreats at a world-class level. We want these to be epic experiences that really drive connection and, and well-being and, and trust and psychological safety, all of these things. So this is like super important for, for teams. And I think it will continue to be more important for teams um, as we get more used to working virtually and, and from a distance. So what everybody, all these random people throughout companies have been asked to do, like, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm, I, I use Bob, the accountant as my, uh, as my figurative person here. So Bob leads the accounting team at company X and, uh, Hey Bob, you've got to do retreats now. Um, so you need to plan a retreat for your team. Well, that's what we do. Uh, Bob says, I'm an accountant. I don't know how to plan retreats. I have no interest in that. It's not what I was hired to do. I crunch numbers and I'm really good at that. Uh, yeah, sorry, Bob, but like, this is your team and you know, we do retreats now. So good luck. Um, here you have uh, $5,000 to do a retreat. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I have no idea if that's a lot of money, not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, by the way. <laughs> um, it's not enough, but let's, you know, let, this is kind of the scenario that that's happened. And so then all of a sudden you have, uh, Bob reaching out to people who do this sort of thing and saying, Hey, I don't even know where to start this is where Tati comes in. Tati has reached out asking this exact question. So in my case, this is something that I love doing. Um, it's one of my favorite activities, one of my favorite parts of my job. And, uh, and you know, it combines travel, it combines teamwork. Um, it combines, uh, you know, finding amazing venues and, and, uh, creating itineraries that mesh with the goals and everything. So I just, I love this, this whole concept and, and it serves the, the entity, uh, the organization really, really well. So, um, we just hosted a retreat. We brought a hundred people to Tuscany in Italy, rented a big villa, did uh, day trips into Florence. We did, um, activities all around the property. We, we just hung out. We did, um, cooking classes. We had workshops, we had presentations. Like it was a, it was just a nice mix of like some work, some leisure, some team building, um, and, and travel. And it's just, you know, a, a perfect, mix of, um, of what these things should be in my opinion. And I really think that this is the key here is like, you have to take your team Tati to a destination that matches with your goals. Um, a destination. So like your goal, for example, could be building team connection. It could be getting a lot of work done. It could be building a new thing. It could be introducing people to each other for the first time. Like you have to, you have to figure out what your why is first of all, and then you have to pick a destination that obviously matches your budget, um, for first of all, <laughs> but then also serves those needs. Um, so for example, I've talked to people who said, you know, we had to get together to just like build this thing. And they went to a, you know, they went to a hotel, a conference center, they sat in a boardroom together and they crunched, they did a bunch of work for like three days. That's one type of retreat, not my favorite. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's, that's one type of retreat. There's also like what, you know, what we did where we were more in like nature, it was all about us. We did a buyout of the whole venue. So it just was our space. Uh, we could go on walks together in the countryside and we could do wine tastings together and we could just hang out by the pool together. But then we could also get a lot of work done for a short period of time and, and crunch some things out that way. So you, you have to figure out the why you have to pick the right venue and you have to uh, and you have to make sure that these are memorable experiences that people return from re-energized and recharged by and not exhausted by there's some level of exhaustion is, is sort of inevitable. Um, to be honest, like you can't, you're, you're going to get together. You're going to have a great time. There's going to be some late nights, some early mornings, you know, people are going to leave somewhat tired, but you have to put your, you have to pump your brakes as the planner to make sure that people don't leave completely fatigued and exhausted. Um, so, you know, avoid the trap of filling the itinerary every single minute with something to do, uh, overestimate on time, moving groups around is super cumbersome. You're always running late. And so you have to tell people that something starts at five when it really starts at five 30. Uh, you have to, if something takes 10 minutes to get to, you need to give yourself 30 minutes, um, and, and things like that. So anyway, just, you know, keep in mind always that the, the reason for the gathering and, what you want to accomplish and then match everything to that. 
I'll give you an example. At Duist, our goal with these is we're, we're very focused on connection. We want people to connect during this. We've we've labeled it Duist Connect as the uh, as the title of the retreat, and then we build everything around that. We want to reinforce our mission statement. We want to reinforce our core values. We want to build time for for people to really connect around things that they're actually interested in. So we have lots of small activities. Like when you bring, I don't know how big your group is, Tati, but let's say you have 50 people or 100 people or 500 people. You need to break that group down into smaller groups. You need people to sit around tables of five to 10. You need people to gather and do things collectively together in groups of 10 or 15 people that really enjoy the same sort of thing. Um, So like as an example of this, we have morning workout sessions where people can join and you can go do yoga or you can go for a run um, or you can do a hit session. Each of those things are going to be joined by people who are interested in that specific thing. So rather than 100 people doing yoga where 10 of them actually care about it, we have 10 people doing yoga that all really enjoy doing yoga. And now those 10 people get to bond around doing yoga. We when we hold cooking classes, we get we pair people up in groups of three, four, five people. So those three, four, five people are creating something together. And instead of a hundred people doing, doing this one activity together, there's a small group where they can actually connect and build bonds. And that's also less overwhelming for introverts, which you really have to keep in mind. Not everyone is an extrovert. Not everyone's built for these activities. For a lot of people, it's overwhelming and exhausting and too much. And so you have to really plan for both introverts and extroverts. So, um, yeah, keep, keep all those things in mind. Also, I want to say like, I, uh, I, I think there's some amazing people out there, people, product services in this space. Um, none of them are sponsoring this show right now, (laughs) but what I will do is, um, there, there may be in the future, but, but there's some incredible products and services out there. So, uh, what I would recommend you doing is I'm going to put a form in the, show notes of this. If you're interested in getting more information on retreat planning services um, or uh, people that are leading the way in this space, uh, venue selection services, like there's so much you could offload 80% of the work to someone else for very low, in some cases, no cost, um, which sounds crazy. But you can offload a lot like venue selection can be incredible. You can you I have someone that I work with. Uh, Her name is Kim. She's incredible. Um, I will connect you with her if you're interested. She finds awesome venues all around the world and it costs me nothing. And she does budget proposals. She does contract negotiations, everything like that. Um, Kim at at Lamont, she's she's amazing. And there's and there's other people uh, in this space that can do do things of that nature for you. So uh, you'll learn a lot, Tati, as you get started in this. Um, I hope I provided some details. Uh, but I'll put this form in the show notes. If you're interested in getting more information on retreat planning and offsite services, anything like that, like any advice, guidance, um, again, a lot of this is for free. Um, and, I'll, and I'll also chime in if uh, if I have some quick answers. The form in the show notes will uh, let me know that you're interested in that. And then I will uh, I will connect you with who I can and um, and get you some more info that way. So anyway, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, we had some amazing questions that I really wanted to get to. We're going to save those for the next time. Again, if you want to drop me a question or get in touch and ask, you know, for any advice or input on something, feel free to do that. You can do it, uh, via the website about abroad.com. There's a contact form there. You can email me chase at about abroad.com. You can also connect with me on, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all of that is available in the show notes. So reach out, ask your questions, send them in. We'll do these every couple months and uh, happy to uh, happy to help and happy to have these interactions with you. Thank you so much for listening and uh, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links. Aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter, no spam, guaranteed. Or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me, it also helps more wanderers just like you find us. 
Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.